All right, so uh, thanks to those who came back. So uh, the second lecture will be at least formally uh, unrelated to the first lecture, but if you remember something from the first lecture, then perhaps some of the techniques or the questions will be uh, will look familiar. So I'm going to start with some motivating questions. So uh, yesterday we looked at how uh, lattice points in R2 uh, distribute themselves with respect to spheres of large radius. So now we're going to consider the hyperbolic plane. So uh, gamma is going to be some group which acts co-compactly, uh, co-finite volume on uh, hyperbolic two space. And what we can take is we can take a point, call it O, or zero, and we can take its orbit under gamma, and we're going to get some picture that looks like this. So you get some periodic picture, and this corresponds to, so if gamma acts cofinite volume, this means that this picture really is the universal cover of a fixed surface of some genus. So it looks something like this. And here we have O. And maybe you have a fundamental domain, which looks maybe something like this. Is it? Ah, it's too far. Maybe you have a fundamental domain, and you would like to understand, again, the type of question. So B R at O is the ball of radius R around O. And you would like to understand the number of orbits of O intersected with this ball. And you could ask, is it proportional to, for example, the volume of this ball? And so this is analogous to the uh, same problem in R2, but now the difference is that, uh, so there's an issue. If you try to do even the simplest error term, so remember, we could try to somehow try to draw these fundamental domains like we did in uh, for the circle, something like this. And we could try to analyze the boundary of the circle. And, but the issue is the following. The issue is that the length of the boundary of the boundary is proportional, well, it's comparable to the volume of the R0. So both quantities are exponential in, uh, in the radius. So they're, they're very large numbers, and so they're, they're of comparable order of magnitude. So if you try to do it, uh, try to do the basic counting this, using the same techniques as, uh, uh, yeah, as in the R2 case, then the, it's, it's not going to work unless you have some extra ideas. And okay, so this is one type of question, but it turns out that the techniques that I'll explain, they allow you to treat more general types of questions. So here's another type of question that you can consider. So you can take O and you take gamma, a closed geodesic, so here's gamma, and then this is covered by a picture that looks something like this. Maybe. So one. This picture is not very accurate, but then you have stuff inside. So this is the universal cover of this type of picture. And here's your point O. And you can again, can ask if you take a sphere of large radius, so again, BR O, you can ask for the number of geodesics, uh, sorry, for the number of geodesics that this sphere meets in the universal cover. So what does it mean that this geodesic is a distance R less than R from this point? It means that if you drop the perpendicular, 
so if this is uh, perpendicular, then this length is less than r. So you see from this point, you, can, you might have a perpendicular that goes this way. You might have some perpendicular that goes uh, on the other side. And you could have some other perpendicular that comes oops, on this side. So, you, so from this point, you can draw many perpendiculars uh, to this geodesic. And they would just correspond to an universal cover of pictures like this. So, and you can ask how many such perpendiculars there are of length less than r. So, you can ask for the number of. So you take, I'm going to call gamma tilde the lift of gamma, intersect with b r zero. This is asymptotic to what? And we'll see that it's asymptotic to the length of this geodesic times, uh, times the, the volume of this ball. So we can treat the, the, the techniques that I'll explain. They can treat these kinds of more general questions. And the way to treat them uh, is going to be by first establishing some equidistribution result. And then see how it's related to counting. So in the case of, uh, I'll just explain the case of the, uh, this uh, co point count. So, so let's say that you take, again, the hyperbolic plane. There's uh, O. Now you consider B, R, O. And now you, instead of considering the ball, let's consider the sphere. So the boundary of B, R, O is S, R, Oh, and we would like to say that when we project this to the surface, this curve that you get on the boundary, it, it, it lies quite uniformly distributed on the surface. So the type of question that, the type of statement that you would consider would be the following. So suppose that you have a function from H2 mod gamma, so a reasonably nice function, and then you lift it. This is the lift. And you consider the integral of f tilde over this sphere. And you, let's say, normalize by the volume of the sphere. Then you would want to say that this converges to the integral over h2 mod gamma of f. So you would like this kind of equidistribution result, which you can get from some dynamical uh, techniques. And once you have such an equidistribution result, then you certainly get, so if spheres are equidistributed, then uh, the whole ball is also equidistributed because if you have a result like this, then you can integrate, right? You can integrate and you will get that the ball itself satisfies a similar type of integral property, right? You'll just replace the volume of the ball and here you'll integrate over the entire ball. So if you have a distribution of spheres, you have a distribution of balls, and if you have a distribution of balls, then uh, how do you get the counting? Well, you, you can take a bump function, a small, you can take your f to be a bump function around O on the surface, and then you'll see that the frequency with which the ball projects to a neighborhood of O is going to approach the volume of this ball, and so, uh, you get this counting result. So I'll do this in a little bit more detail in a second, but I just wanted to explain at least vaguely why such equidistribution results can give you the counting results. Are there questions so far about the idea? No. All right, so now I'll uh, state things in the more, more general setup and uh, how, how these technique, techniques work. So. I should say the following. So th these types of questions about, for example, counting uh, lattice points in the hyperbolic plane, uh, they go back a long time. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly who were the, maybe the first people to, to do this, but I think uh, maybe Haber or Hubert or, and Selberg and some other people had some uh, results about this counting. But the general setup that I'll discussing is following Eskin and McMullen. This is a little bit more recent. And their approach was one of the first ones after Margulis that used dynamics uh, to study these kinds of counting problems. So uh, 
so, some of their results were covered by Margulis, but not all of them. And uh, most of the countering results before that were done using spectral methods, like in the first lecture. So the setup is going to be the following. G is going to be some semi-simple Lie group. So if that is too much, you can consider SL2R or SLNR. Uh, gamma is going to be a lattice in G. So again, SL2Z or SLNZ. And we're going to have a subgroup, H, inside G. Uh, so I'm going to uh, put a, uh, this is a technical assumption, and I'll explain uh, in a moment what it means, so such that G mod H is what's called, so, let say, G mod H is a fine symmetric. So more precisely, this means that uh, there exists sigma from G to G in evolution such that H is the fixed points of sigma. And to just have some examples, uh, you can take SLNR and H to be SONR. And for SL2, you can take H to be the diagonal matrices. So this also works. And there are some uh, variants of, uh, of this. Um, what, what I want to say is that, yeah, so, so, so th th this is the, uh, going to be the setup. And so we're going to have these equidistribution results and uh, counting results. Ah, sorry. Uh, so the, the key assumption on G, sorry, so I should say uh, on H, so assume that gamma intersect H is a lattice in H. So uh, this example, when G is SL to R and H is this group, or some group conjugated to this, correspond, will correspond to the example of a geodesic. So remember, a geodesic corresponds to that, geode the geodesic flow corresponds to the diagonal subgroup. A closed geodesic is a closed orbit of the diagonal subgroup. So this means that if you have a closed geodesic, you have a gamma intersecting the diagonal subgroup in a, one, in a Z, a Z subgroup. And so th this example will um, be a non-trivial example which applies to this uh, geodesic counting problem. Okay, so this is the, this is the setup. And then the first uh, theorem is that these guys proved. This is an equidistribution theorem. So it says the following. So we define Y to be this group that uh, this thing that we assumed is a lattice. So it's gamma intersect H, modulo H, and G, uh, and X. So it's contained in X, which is uh, gamma mod G. So you have a picture like this. You have your X, maybe it looks like this, and then you have some subset. This is Y. So you have some, so both, both of them have finite volume because, and they have a natural volume, and uh, Y sits inside X, so that the equidistribution result says that for any F, let's say, smooth and compactly supported, it's enough to be continuous on X. So you have a function, you can average it over X, or you can average it over the orbits of y. So you can do the following. So you can consider the integral over y times g. So you act with g. So you have g mod gamma, and g acts on g mod gamma on the right. So you can act on the right by a big element in g, and you move around y. So you apply an element, and y moves in some complicated way, and you divide by the volume of y, g, which is the same as the volume of y if you normalize it correctly and you integrate f, so then this approaches the integral over x, sorry, 
again, the normalization factor has to be the volume of x, the integral over x of f, and this happens as g goes to infinity in uh, g mod h. So this quotient g mod h is some uh, variety which is going to be uh, important. So, uh, okay. So this is the equidistribution result. Okay. So then uh, we'll have, for, the similar, for a similar setup, we'll have the counting. Uh, sorry? Uh, yes, well, you have to conjugate it. So you can take a conjugate of H. So uh, everything I say is the group H should be this group up to conjugation. So there will be a conjugate of this group which will intersect SL to Z in a geodesic. And uh, yeah, so, so this group will indeed not intersect SL to Z, but there will be plenty of conjugates of this group which will intersect SL to Z in a geodesic. And uh, it's about those groups that we're talking. Okay, so I, I, uh, does this clarify it? Or? Yeah, so I apologize. So I, I should say that yes, the group H, I'll usually write it in some simple form like this, but it's always assumed that you can, you can conjugate things to be in this form. It doesn't have to be of this necessarily of this form. Okay. Where equivalently, you can always conjugate gamma. So you see, if you have the lattice gamma, you can always conjugate the lattice by, so you can take G gamma G inverse, and it's always going to be, again, a lattice, and then you can assume that H is of that form, but the lattice is a little bit different. Okay. So now, uh, you also have the counting theorem. So the counting theorem uh, uh, works in the same setup, but now what you consider is the following. So you have, uh, so again, you have your G mod H, and you have here a point, let's call it O, and you can consider the orbit gamma times O. So this is the orbit of O. And so the assumption that gamma intersect H is a lattice is essentially equivalent in this case to, uh, is equivalent to the fact that gamma inter times O inside G mod H uh, is discrete. So the discreteness of this set is equivalent to um, the gamma intersect O being uh, a lattice, gamma intersect H being a lattice. So I'll, I'll try to uh, come back to these two examples uh, in a second and try to explain what these theorems are saying. But now, uh, if this is a discrete set, we can start trying to count things. So we assume that Bn is a sequence of reasonable sets. So the condition that they introduce is called well-rounded and I'll explain in a second uh, what, what well-rounded means. So Bn are contained in this G mod H. And so the, th the theorem, the, the counting theorem is that uh, one over the volume of these sets, Bn, times the, sorry, let me write it rather in this form. So the number of elements in this orbit which intersect Bn is asymptotic, so if you divide the left side by the right side, you uh, sometimes you get one. So this is asymptotic to the volume of the BNs. And so, and I assume that uh, the volume of BN goes to infinity. So the sets get larger and larger. So uh, how, l l let me do first the picture with the geodesics. Let's say that G is SL to R. G is SL to R, and H is the diagonal subgroup. Then 
so uh, as you know, SL2R has a natural representation. So if you think about the adjoint representation, it acts in R3. Uh, okay. Of these guys. Uh, so SL2R acts, so if you want, this is the adjoint representation on R3, where equivalently it's, it, it's locally isomorphic to SO21. So SO21 acts on R3 in a natural way. And so you get these three types of orbits. So the orbit, so hopefully if you've seen the hyperbolic plane before, you know that the hyperbolic plane corresponds to one of these hyperboloids. So this subgroup, this, uh, I, I don't know, I guess this is also a hyperboloid or whatever this outside figure is called. So this is going to be G mod A. So the stabilizer, stabilizer of a point here is going to be this subgroup A, and you get G mod A, so this is the space of geodesics, of geodesics. Uh, in H2, and the H2 is this guy. So this is G, so this, this group is G mod K, uh, which is H2, and K is SO2R. So if you have a point here, then you get a geodesic on this plane. How do you get it? You take the orthogonal, the perpendicular, which is going to be a plane, and it's going to cut this thing uh, in a geodesic. And so what, the, uh, what, what, do you, what, the, the, what does it mean to take a closed geodesic? So, so gamma inside SL2R acts on this. And so a gamma orbit on this hyperboloid corresponds on this out, outer hyperboloid corresponds to a, a geodesic. So let me try to draw some kind of orbit it's supposed to live on, on this outside hyperboloid. So if this orbit is discrete, then this corresponds to a closed geodesic. You see, if you take a non-closed geodesic, a non-closed geodesic is typically going to be dense on this surface, and its orbit in this space is going to be dense under the action of gamma. So gamma doesn't act co-compactly on, even if it, it acts co-compactly on the hyperbolic space, but it doesn't act co-compactly. In fact, it, most of the orbits are dense. But there are some points, the special points corresponding to closed geodesics, which will, be, uh, which will have this discrete orbit. So the counting theorem over here refers to the following fact. You take, uh, essentially, imagine a sphere of large radius, and it will intersect this hyperboloid in some set. And the volume of that set with a natural measure will be proportional to the, to the number of green points that you see in this picture. Okay? So this is the counting uh, theorem for the case of geodesics. And for the case of uh, when H is uh, SO2R, this is just a hyperbolic plane. And we're doing the, uh, so this assumption that gamma intersect H is a lattice is trivial because H is compact. So it's true for any gamma, and then we're counting lattice points in this geodesic, in the hyperbolic space. Okay, so are there questions about these two examples, how they work? No. Okay, so, so now I can move on to the proofs. Sorry, what happened to the chalk? So, I have to explain first what, what are going to be the main tools that uh, will work in. Oh, I didn't explain what well-rounded means. So well-rounded, a set is well-rounded. So, so this is referred to a family of points Bn. So it says the following. It says that for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists U epsilon, neighborhood of the identity in G. Such that, so you want a set as well-rounded if you can approximate it from inside 
by smaller sets, by reasonable smaller sets, and you can also approximate it from the outside. So you want the following inequality to be true. The volume of Bn, you want it to be bounded by y minus epsilon times the volume of the following set. So you take the intersection, sorry, uh, the lower bound probably want the union, yes. So you want the union over all g in u epsilon of, this, of the translates, g times uh, bn. So you have your set and you move it around a little bit and you take the union of all of the sets that you get and this should not be much larger than the volume of the set that you started with and you also want a lower, an upper bound which should be one plus epsilon times the volume of the intersection where g is in u epsilon of g bn. So this g times bn is, when you intersect them, you get a smaller set than bn, and you want this to be roughly of the same size for any epsilon. Okay, so now the setup is as it is here. So I'm just going to keep it. And so l let me mention the tools that will be used. So main tools, so just as a reminder, so this appeared in uh, Amir's lectures, so we have how and more uh, mixing. So it says the following, it says that if you have alpha, beta, two functions in L2 of G mod gamma, oh, so I'm, I'm going to put the star to mean uh, this is so this means average zero. So it's functions that average to zero on, uh, on this group, uh, on this quotient space. Then uh, the following holds. You get that the integral of g pullback a alpha times beta over this. So let me, I'm going to start abbreviating this space by x. That this... Uh, so that the, these uh, functions, they asymptotically become orthogonal as g goes to infinity in uh, g mod gamma. Sorry, what I'm saying, yeah. As, as, as g go, uh, goes to infinity in g. So you uh, act on the function, uh, you, you move one of the functions and it becomes asymptotically orthogonal to uh, Yeah, yes, sorry, yes, thank you. Uh, gamma inside G is irreducible. And this is probably an assumption that wouldn't be bad to make here, just to be safe. And yeah, G is non-compact. Uh, yeah, uh, th th this is Yes. So this theorem is certainly false for, and yeah, it's, it's false for G compact. Okay. So uh, okay. So now uh, l l l let me f formulate it slightly equivalently. So now for any alpha and beta in L two of G mod gamma, we're going to take. So we're going to do the, so this is just the same theorem, but now uh, you see what happens if you, the functions have uh, uh, integral one, and the, the claim is that this will be uh, approximately the integral of alpha times integral of a beta plus a quantity that goes to zero. So this goes to zero as as g goes to infinity, sorry, I am sorry that for writing here. But does everybody see at least a little o of one? So let me write it here, plus a little o of one. So we have this uh, asymptotic equidistribution, which is, so this is just the same statement as over there. Okay, so then uh, we, so, so, so then the, the, the other key input, which will, 
which we'll need is the following geometric uh, assumption. So this is where the uh, assumption that H is a fine symmetric comes in. So we have the wave front lemma. So it says the following. So, so let, me, let me draw a picture on this side. So let's say that this is G, and inside you have H. So uh, what the wavefront lemma allows you to do is it allows you to thicken H a little bit, such that if you move it, so here is GH, uh, then Sorry, uh, I want to act on the right side, I'm sorry. So HG, then, so if you move it a little bit, then this group is in the neighborhood, so this new neighborhood is not too distorted. So let me say the following. So for any a neighborhood uh, U epsilon of identity in G, there exists a neighborhood U delta, of identity in G. So this is the type of statement that you see in continuity. For any epsilon, there's a delta such that if you take the group G and then you thicken it by this U delta, this is uh, H times U delta, and then you act by G, any element G, so for any G in G, so you act on this. You act on the thickening. You move it. Then you're still contained in this uh, single orbit times u epsilon. Okay. So it says that if you've moved it, you haven't really moved. So nearby orbits of H look uh, similar. Okay. So yeah. Sorry, can I say it again? Every. Neighborhood, sorry, NBHD, sorry. sorry. Any neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, okay, so with these preliminaries, we can, so, uh, we can prove the equidistribution distribution result quite easily. Okay, so proof of equidistribution. distribution. So first we're going to prove equidistribution and then uh, we're going to prove uh, how equidistribution implies uh, counting. Okay, so what, what's the setup? We have x is g mod gamma. It contains y, which is h intersect gamma mod h. And we want to show, so we'll show that show for b beta continuous, compactly supported on x uh, that the integral over y times g one over volume of y beta approaches one over volume of x, the integral over x of beta. And the way to do it is basically using uh, the two things that we know how to do. So we're going to, so Howe Moore theorem applies, you see the problem with Howe Moore theorem is that it applies to functions, to functions, not to, vari not to geometric objects, not to submanifolds. So what we're going to do, we're going to make a function out of our manifold and we're going to make a function using the thickening that we can, uh, that we can produce using the wave front lemma. So what we do is we thicken uh, y. So so fix an epsilon which is very small. So we'll fix an epsilon neighborhood which is very small and how small it is will depend on beta which is uniformly continuous. So you can assume that it's not just continuous, maybe smooth. Uh, or if it's compact support then it's uniformly continuous. So we think in y and we're, we're going to show that this is true up to any epsilon. So if we show that this limit holds up to an error of epsilon for any epsilon then this is uh, true in general. So how are we going to thicken y? We consider uh, y times u epsilon. 
sorry, u delta. u epsilon is our precision, and we thicken y. So this is an open set. That in uh, x. So if, if, if you draw a picture, this is x, maybe here is y, then we've kind of thickened it, thickened it a little bit. So now you consider the indicator function. So take alpha, uh, alpha, let me call it alpha delta, to be the indicator function of this thickened orbit. And, sorry, so, and the point is that this, by how more we know that this will be what we want. How more it tells us that one over the volume of y, uh, sorry, one over the volume of y delta. So uh, le let me call this set. So y times u delta, let's call this y delta, times the integral over y delta times g of beta approaches one over the volume of x of beta of x, right? Because we're just integrating. So integrating against this function, uh, alpha delta, essentially amounts to integrating beta over this open set. And we divide by the volume because, so you use the howe moore theorem in this form. So you can move the volume of x uh, to the side. So if, if you work out, you'll get exactly, uh, if you apply just how more, you'll get exactly this statement. So now, uh, we but we want to uh, compare. So what do we want to say? So I want to say, so the claim that the, the, we're basically done is that one over the volume of y delta, the integral over y delta times g beta is equal to the volume of volume of y delta. So, yeah, sorry, I was confused. Okay, so the integral over y delta of g of y times the integral over y of beta plus something that goes to zero. So I claim that the integral, so this integral over here, so you can move the volume, one over volume of y delta over on the other side. So the, this integral is basically the integral of beta over y times the normalization factor plus some small error. So, and so this follows from the uh, wavefront lemma. So the, 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 the claim now follows from this wavefront lemma because what, what is the picture? You see, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to draw maybe a caricature. So let's say that this is sorry, GY here. Can people see in this corner? So if this is GY, so yeah, YG, G acts on the right, then the wavefront lemma tells us that this Y delta, right? Y delta is the Y U delta thickening of Y. So the wavefront lemma tells us that if we act on the left by G on this set, then we're in the epsilon neighborhood of the, so we're in the, uh, this epsilon neighborhood So by the wavefront lemma, we have that y delta times g is contained inside inside uh, y times g times u epsilon. 
And beta is a uniformly continuous function, so essentially averaging, so the, the correct thing to be would be to just move this y delta, so let me, so the average, so one over the volume of y delta, the integral over y delta of beta, is approximately the same as the average over just this volume of y, and the, sorry, g, 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 So because these, so they're, uh, they're approximately the same up to an error which depends on epsilon and the uniform continuity of, uh, and the uniform continuity of uh, beta. So we, we, we get that these quantities are essentially the same, which is exactly this equality. So you just move one of the, of the volume of y delta to the other side. And this is uh, what we wanted because, you see, here we have this integral the thick over the thickening, and we just proved that this integral over the thickening is the same as the integral, essentially the same as the integral over uh, just the orbit itself up to some small error. And we proved this for any error. For any epsilon we want, this is uh, so small enough. So this uh, gives us the equidistribution result. So, okay, so I don't think anybody ever complained if I, if I end early, so let me just say that next time I'll finish proving how equidistribution gives counting. Uh, and I roughly sketched the idea uh, at the beginning. So if you, if you have that these orbits equidistribute, then uh, you, you can obtain some counting results. So the sphere equidistribution already gives you the counting for lattice points, but I'll explain how to essentially kind of transfer these integrals in general. And so this idea of uh, kind of transferring an integral from one homogeneous space to another is going to be useful, and we'll see it uh, hopefully in, in, the other, in the next lectures in other contexts. So I'm going to stop here. Thanks. Thank you.